very pleased to be here. Um, this is not my first visit to Sofia, but probably this is the grandest room I've ever spoken in. Um, it reflects, I think, the importance of the subject, although it's a far cry from the conditions about the people we're talking about in reality, they will not be in such circumstances. Uh, I'm grateful also for your introduction, uh, which I would say is in your tradition of your descents, uh, in terms of your, your reading of Seldes, but I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, the title of my presentation is, is negative, um, and although I tend to be an optimistic person, this reflects the fact that uh, the reality of the situation is that access to a lawyer is frequently still being denied. Um, and unfortunately, um, although there are some good aspects to the case law of the European Court, there are also quite a number of instances where access is not being regarded as important and therefore um, we get into serious problems. And indeed, um, referring to some of the recent case law, particularly the case of Ibrahim and others against the United Kingdom and the Sinierovi against Bulgaria cases, there is the thinking that the court is actually moving backwards. My view is that that's perhaps a, an overreaction, but I'll come back to that question. Um, but there are serious problems with the case law which I want to go into. The court, however, has said um, that access to a lawyer should be provided from the initial stage, unless it is demonstrated uh, in the light of the particular circumstances that there are compelling reasons to defer it. But even then, the court has said that where there is some delay, this should not uh, lead to the undue prejudice to the rights of the accused under Article 6. Um, the importance of access to a lawyer has also been recognised by the European Committee for the Prevention of Torture and Human Degraded Treatment. As the committee has stated, the possibility that persons taken to police custody to have access to a lawyer is a fundamental safeguard against ill treatment. The existence of that possibility will have a dissuasive effect upon those minded to ill-treat the detained person. Further, a lawyer is well placed to take appropriate action if ill-treatment actually occurs. To be fully effective, the right of access to a lawyer should be guaranteed as from the outset of a person's deprivation of liberty. A very clear and unambiguous statement about what should be required. The reluctance of the committee to assume that those who have control of persons deprived of liberty can be entirely trusted is also seen in the approach of the United States Supreme Court in the case of Miranda and Arizona. Um, <coughs> and therefore they insisted that they would not accept any um, material um, in evidence unless it was demonstrated that the person had been notified of the right to remain silent, the right to the presence of an attorney, and that the person concerned had knowingly and intelligently waived those rights and agreed to answer statements, make answer questions or make a statement. But it's important when reminding ourselves of these statements to bear in mind that the approach of both the European Court and the US Supreme Court are somewhat different from that of the European Committee for the Prevention of Torture because their concern is not with the issue of their treatment as such, it's concerned with the trial and um, the um, way in which that unfolds. And therefore, I think it's important when looking at this question, in particular the case law of the court, not simply to start from Saldo's case, but actually to go back um, to before that and see how the line of reasoning has developed. It's also important to bear in mind that the convention itself has nothing to do with the pre-trial proceedings, except in relation to Article 5, which is concerned with the question of deprivation of liberty and judicial supervision of that deprivation of liberty. It is not concerned at all uh, explicitly with the question of access to a lawyer. And if you look at the case law of the, both the former commission and the court over the many years since the convention came into place, you will see that for probably getting on for 35 years, the issue of access to a lawyer did not actually feature um, in the case law at all. Or if it did, it was held that the claim of denial of access was not substantiated, or occasionally that there was no prejudice. The first real change in approach came in the 1988 judgment of Barbera, Mercedes, and Javado against Spain, 
where the court expressed reservations about confessions having been detained during a long period of custody in which the applicants had been held incommunicado. But although it expressed those reservations, when you look at the actual finding that there was a violation of the convention, it does not actually rely upon that fact that they were kept incommunicado. So it's a warning sign, but no more than that. The big change came with the judgment in Imbrosiosa and Switzerland, um, where the court rejected the view of the Swiss government, which was clearly shared by a good number of other governments in the Council of Europe, that Article 6 had no application to pretrial proceedings. This was the general approach they were trying to suggest that it was irrelevant. Um, but that clearly was an untenable position, not least given the earlier judgment in Golder against the United Kingdom, uh, where Article 6 was concerned with the question of even getting access to court, albeit in a civil matter. And so the court emphasized, as it often likes to do, with this wonderful statement that the rights under the convention are not theoretical or illusory, but practical and effective. A very good statement, but in reality, if you look at the Grossiosi case, actually rather hollow, because although the court makes the statement about the right of access, when it came to looking at the situation, it found that there was no violation of the convention at all. And the reason in which it did so was the way in which it saw the right of access to lawyer, which, or the assistance of a lawyer rather, which is set out in Article 6, Paragraph 3C, um, which in its wording would seem to be connected with only the trial process. It does accept that it applies to the pretrial stage, but it also linked that provision of the convention to the general right of a fair trial under Article 6, Paragraph 1. And that is where the real problem has become. Because once you make that link, what the court is then doing is being concerned about whether or not the overall fairness of the proceedings has been compromised by the defect. And that was the view that was found not to be established in the Ingrosia case itself. The court, as it has done subsequently in many instances, says you have to scrutinize the proceedings and then decide whether or not the person has been denied a fair trial. And in this particular case, they took the view that although he had been denied a lawyer at certain interrogations, he had then failed to complain subsequently about the inactivity of his lawyer once he received the lawyer's assistance. Um, and they also emphasized how important it was that at the trial, he was assisted by a lawyer and was able to uh, challenge the evidence. So that starting point, which in many ways was presented as a great development, and in, in some sense it is, nonetheless contains an inherent flaw which is highly problematic. And the analysis of the majority of the court really is problematic as Lord Judge Lopez Rocha in his dissent pointed out, it fails to take account of the fact that the right to seek to refute the evidence obtained, including any confession made at this stage, is frequently insufficient to overturn opinions formed on the basis of statements made in the absence of lawyer. In other words, prejudice already arises. More importantly, I think, in my view, the approach of the court in the BOC case fails to recognize that Article 6, 3C, paragraph 3C rather, has an independent existence and so necessarily precludes insistence on having access to a lawyer as something that is essential in all cases. And so you get to a situation um, that you are looking with retrospective effect in, in, a, in circumstances where actually at the time when it most matters, you cannot really be clear how the course of events is going to unfold. That is why it is so important that you have access to lawyer at the outset, because no one knows. Um, and if you wait afterwards, then prejudice may well have arisen. And so the approach to the court, which was established in the Swiss case, was quite different from that of the European Committee for the Prevention of Torture, in that they were not concerned with exercising any dissuasive influence on law enforcement officials, who might well be tempted to disregard national legal provisions, and indeed 
as we see in many cases, there are plenty of national legal guarantees of right of access to lawyer, but they're not necessarily implemented, and that's highly problematic. And it's a consequence of that approach that on many occasions the court has actually rejected cases which have been brought complaining about denial of access to lawyer on the basis that the complaints are premature because the trial has not actually concluded and therefore the court says we cannot judge this matter. Now of course there have been important decisions in which the approach of the court in Indonesia has been uh, had reached a satisfactory result. A good example can be seen in the case of John Murray in the United Kingdom in which the court did find that irretrievable prejudice had been caused by the denial of access to a lawyer. In that instance you were dealing with a situation where there was a question of if you were exercised the right to remain silent, which existed, there was the possibility under the law of the United Kingdom that adverse inferences could be drawn from that silence at the trial, and that may be part of the evidence um, that would use to find guilty. The court therefore recognised it was important that a person who is making the choice between being silent or speaking um, should have the advice of the lawyer so that they are informed in terms of the choice they make. And in those circumstances, the majority of the court reached the conclusion, therefore, that because there was no access to a lawyer for 24 hours, um, there was irretrievable prejudice. Now, in this case, of course, inferences had been drawn in the trial, so therefore, that was a significant factor in terms of the conviction, potentially, at least as far as the majority was concerned. But it's important when looking at the John Murray case, good though the judgment is, to have in mind the fact that there was a dissent by seven judges in this case. And they reached a view that the trial had not been rendered unfair because Mr. John Murray had been given a warning about the effect of remaining silent. There had been no argument that he had actually any innocent explanation to give, which would explain um, why it was important that the um, exercise the choice to remain silent um, was the subject of advice, and also they emphasised that the judge had discretion as to whether or not the inference should be drawn. And well, moreover, they also said that there were other factors which were the, really the main basis of conviction. So this, this dissent, I think, underlines how ingrained the attitude of the part of the judges of the European Court is with consideration of applying Article 6.3c in separately with Article 6.1. And so there are many instances where you find sometimes the court reaches the conclusion that there has been prejudice, but there are as many cases where the court reaches the conclusion there are not. And indeed, such is the importance emphasized by the court in relation to Article 6.1, that there are many cases, probably 40 or 50 cases, in which the European Court has been faced with complaints about denial of access to a lawyer, but the court has said there is no need to rule on this question because it had already found that there was a denial of the right to a fair trial, albeit the denial of a fair trial had no reference to the question of denial of access to a lawyer. So it just simply pushed those cases out of consideration. When it comes to the Sanders case, of course, we see things looking somewhat differently. It might seem to be much more defence-oriented. Um, it emphasises, you see, the right statements being made, the risk of abusive coercion on the part of the authorities, the contribution made by access to a lawyer in preventing miscarriages of justice and securing the quality of arms. The court also recognised that an accused person when detained by the authorities, was often in a vulnerable position and considered that early access to a lawyer was part of the procedural safeguards to which it would have regard in, when examining whether the procedure examined the privilege against self-incrimination. All these are very good statements. We all will regard them as helpful. They're the right kind of approach. And indeed, the court also cited um, the standards of the European Committee for the Prevention of Torture about access to legal advice being a fundamental safeguard against ill treatment. And then it went on and said that, as a rule, emphasis added, access to a lawyer should be provided as from the first interrogation of a suspect. 
So all is looking very good, and we can assume that this might be a new departure. But if you look really at the judgment in Salmas, you will see that nothing really had changed, because the rule was based upon Article 6.1, not upon Article 6, Paragraph 3C. Moreover, the European Court underlined that the statement made by the applicant had been used as the main evidence. Now, what is that actually talking about? The question of its impact on the, fair, the overall fairness. And all the more sickened as the court, trial court was found by the European Court not to address the applicant's denial of the accuracy of the statement concerned, or indeed certain exculpatory evidence and the retraction of statements by co-accused on the same basis. Now, of course, the court also talked about the problem in which at last it had actually come to be aware of, because those 40 or 50 cases I mentioned in which the court said there was no need to have regard to the issue of denial of access were all cases from Turkey. Uh, but now the court suddenly realized actually there is a systematic problem in Turkey. And therefore, when seeing that, one can think in terms that we are now talking about a real rule at the pre-trial stage. And so that might lead you to think that the court was worrying about um, the, the need for preventive measure rather than looking at the question of the impact of the denial of access on the overall fairness of the proceedings. But my view is that this is a misguided reading of the judgment, seeing what ought to be in the judgment rather than what actually is there, the question of wishful thinking, uh, even though that wishful thinking is really the right approach. And if you look at the subsequent case law, apart from what's the Salvo's case, you will see the court continues to be emphasizing the question of what has been the impact of the denial of access on the fairness of the proceedings as a whole. For example, if you look at the case of Pishchalnikov against Russia, where you had statements made without any legal assistance, in this instance, the statements were not the sole evidence on which his conviction was based, but the court nonetheless said that they were decisive for the prospects of his defense and to constitute a significant element in his conviction. Again, you're looking about, therefore, what is important about why the denial of access um, took place. A, a different approach reading and a more uh, consistent reading with the wishful thinking about the Saudi judgment can be seen in the, the case of Aris and Turkey number two, in which the majority, and it's important to emphasize the majority of the chamber, relied only upon the statement that access was required as a rule from the first question. In other words, they took a very uh, good reading, as some people would say, of the Saudi judgment. They emphasized this part. Um, they also uh, talked about the systematic denial, but they didn't talk anything about the actual uh, impact of the denial on the outcome of the trial proceedings. So that looks like we really are on track, that uh, despite my attempt to suggest that silence is not what it says, the court does look as if it's going in the direction of saying you should have access. But the party was spoiled by the dissenting judgments uh, of Judges Spano and Lemons um, because they went back and looked closely, as I have done, at the question of what actually was said in Saldus. And they emphasized that the reading was, that the majority was wrong because the issue was whether or not irretrievable prejudice had been caused. And therefore, they suggested the majority of the court were taking the emphasis placed on the systematic denial as being completely out of context. More worryingly, and this then bears fruit in, in the later judgments, these two judges also go on to say that you need to look at the issue of uh, access to a lawyer in the context of other case law, which is not nothing to do with the right of access to a lawyer, referring in particular to the Grand Chamber judgments in Taxka in Belgium and Al Khawaja in Tahiri. Because there, they, the court is saying that the fair trial guarantee of Article 6, Paragraph 1, and the auxiliary safeguards in Paragraph 3 
were not to be read as encompassing automatic rules of criminal procedure, rather that there was to be an overall judicial assessment as to whether a person charged with a criminal act has been treated fairly at the domestic level. And this, in their view, this approach meant that the high contracting parties of the Convention had a discretion as to the methods they chose in which to uh, achieve a fair trial. All rather worrying kind of statements as we move into the area of subsidiarity, uh, which increasingly is emphasized in the court. And we can see that this minority approach is really the one which was decisive in the later Grand Chamber rulings in the three cases of Dvorsky in Croatia, Ibrahim and others against the United Kingdom, and most recently Simeonovi and Bulgaria. The first case, the Dvorsky case, does have the merit of recognizing that the access to a lawyer is important for a whole range of different considerations, including the whole way in which you prepare the defense, the kind of investigation, and even providing support for a person who is vulnerable. In other words, not simply providing legal advice, but actually being someone there who can help the person go through the difficult circumstances of being in interrogation. Unfortunately, that element of the judgment in Dvorsky seems to have been forgotten in subsequent rulings, uh, and there was no response to submissions based upon that in the Simeonova case that the court simply seems to forget that these are important considerations. So in the, the two other cases, the Ibrahim case and the Simeonova case, you see the court emphasizing not only the need for overall uh, impact to be assessed, but also elaborating at great length the factors that it considers important for determining whether or not there has been an impact on the overall fairness. And the court says there are, in the judgment, particularly in Ibrahim, endorsed in Simonovi, there are, there are at least 10 factors. The good news, perhaps, is these 10 factors were said not to be exhaustive, so if you have some other ideas, you can add these, um, but uh, it remains to be seen whether the, the, the court will accept them. So you have to take, first of all, the question of the particular vulnerability of the applicant, age, mental capacity in particular. Secondly, the legal framework governing the pretrial proceedings and the admissibility of evidence, as well as the issue of compliance. And if there is an exclusionary rule which is used, then that's going to mean that probably there is no unfairness. The existence of an opportunity for the person to challenge the authenticity of the evidence and to oppose its use. It doesn't mean that it's accepted, it's having the opportunity which is important. The quality of the evidence and the existence of circumstances casting doubt on its reliability and accuracy, taking into account any compulsion. So the good news is that if your client is tortured or ill-treated, then you stand a stronger chance of, of winning on this case. But uh, that isn't, of course, always what happens. The nature of the unlawfulness use, so again coming back to the question of was ill-treatment used. The nature of the statements made and the issue of whether it was properly retracted. So important, therefore, that you immediately deny any confession you made, perhaps. Uh, but of course, that doesn't mean to say that it has to carry weight. The use to which the evidence was put, the extent to which it formed an integral or significant part of the probative evidence upon which the conviction was based, as well as the strength of the other evidence. The nature of the tribunal, was it trial by professional judges or by lay jurors? Uh, and if it was the latter, what was the quality of the directions given to those jurors? And then the weight of the public interest in the investigation and punishment of a particular offence in issue. I'll come back to that in a moment. And then finally, any other relevant procedural safeguards which exist under domestic law practice. Now, in the Ibrahim case, the court found that as far as three of the applicants in using these factors, that there was no irretrievable prejudice concern. They emphasized that the delay was short, between four and eight hours in these particular cases. It was prescribed by law. There were rules in the admissibility of evidence, which were considered an argument before the trial court. 
there was an absence of any evidence of compulsion, and there was existence of other strong evidence. And also, there was a strong public interest in the investigation and punishment of the offences in question, which were terrorist-related offences. On the other hand, in the case of the fourth applicant, who had initially been treated as a witness, there was no legal basis for continuing to question him, so therefore one of the factors was failed. But if you look at his situation, as is pointed out by some of the separate opinions, there really wasn't much difference between the fourth applicant and the other three in terms of the case. And that goes to the question of the difficulty you might see in actually working out whether you're going to win or not on the question of talking about how the factors work. But what is particularly, or at least potentially disturbing about the Ibrahim case is this emphasis on the question of the public interest in investigation and punishment. It is unclear to me what this has to do with the question of fairness of proceedings. Um, it, it's important, but it's not important for a question of fairness, unless you're saying, in some respect, that you can lower the standard of fairness in cases where there is a real need to prosecute people like nasty terrorists. But when you look at the case, I don't think that was actually what a factor was at all, even though they referred to it. It didn't seem that they were lowering the standards, but it opens the door um, to the possibility that later judgments would, would do so. And that seems to run counter to the whole approach that the courts had in the past, because really the issue of lowering the standards should only be accompanied where you have a derogation under Article 15. So it, to my mind, it's highly questionable about whether uh, this factor should be included in the list at all. Uh, really, where, where it is relevant is the question of whether there is a re good reason for delaying access. Uh, but that's about the question of the propriety of delaying access, not whether or not there has been an effect on the fairness of the proceedings. In the Simonioli case, the overall fairness of the proceedings was also considered by the majority of the court to have been secured despite the applicant having been questioned over a three-day period without being allowed access to a lawyer, and notwithstanding that there was a clear right under national law that he should have been given access to the assistance of a lawyer. The court, in finding no violation in this case, seems to have reached the view on the basis that no evidence was used, capable of being used against him had been obtained and included in the case file. Um, and the question of the confession which he made had been subsequent to the three days of his questioning. And it also emphasised the point that he was legally represented when making the confession. However, this is perhaps not the place to go into full debate about the fact that when he made the confession with the assistance of the lawyer, he actually had no opportunity to talk to that lawyer in private. Uh, important point about the confidentiality. Um, the absence also of access to legal advice during the questioning, did that have some impact on the future course of the proceedings? And there are issues, for example, where you have the question of who was most culpable of the two applicant, two defendants in this case. Uh, these are questions which were not explored. Now, what I'm not going to say for sure that any of these things were decisive. One can't tell. But the point about mentioning them is that these go to the question of whether or not overall fairness might have been accepted. And in reality, what the court is doing is becoming a fourth instance in making a judgment about whether or not someone um, was fairly convicted, which the court consistently says it is not supposed to be doing. So there is inconsistency in the court's approach. And you see some recognition of this in the one of the dissenting judgments of judges Shaila, Frank, Vucinic, and Turkovic, who say the court is in danger of running the risk of replacing the evaluation of fairness of trial with that of the plausibility of a conviction. But to my mind, that's what's happening all the time. In reality, the court is saying, when looking at the different factors, that the conviction is plausible and the court conviction is plausible, then in those circumstances there's no unfairness. Now, without accepting the overall fairness approach, it's regrettable that the list of factors uh, which I've mentioned doesn't explicitly refer to one which was 
emphasized in another case, the case of Todorov in Ukraine, namely the impossibility of excluding that the very existence of self-incriminations will influence the way in which the investigation is then conducted and the manner in which evidence was taken and evaluated. In other words, if you have something said, does it shape your interpretation of the events? It may be that this can be regarded as implicit, but it seems to me would be desirable at the very least, if you're going to continue with this approach, that you make it much more explicit. Now, having been very critical of all the court has said, I think it is important to rest the balance slightly by talking about some of the important developments in the case law in terms of access to court. First of all, the court has made it clear, including in, in Bohem and Simeovi, that it, there is a duty to inform a suspect about his or her right to legal assistance, and that this is something which should occur, occur immediately, irrespective of the person's age or specific situation, and irrespective of whether they are being represented by a public or private attorney. Now, of course, the importance of this right is only one where it's acted upon, uh, which then shows that the court isn't always been completely joined up. And what we see in Simeovi was that there was no evidence that uh, Simeovi was informed of his right, uh, but it, he actually knew of it anyway, but the fact that he asked for it was ignored. So having the right of access doesn't, of information doesn't necessarily take him too far. Perhaps more importantly, the court takes quite a strict approach to the question of whether or not the, the right to assistance of a lawyer has been waived. So you will find it difficult for a government to claim that get this claim that has been waiver, where they cannot show that the person has been informed of the right. And that was one of the difficulties the government had in Simeovi. They couldn't really prove there was no record to show that he had been informed of the right of access. It's also unlikely the court will regard a waiver as being voluntary where the suspect has been subjected to a treatment or where he or she is unaware of the consequences, which may sometimes happen when you are misled by the way the inter interrogation proceeds, and also where the legitimacy of the waiver is under undermined by a structural problem. So, for example, um, in cases in Ukraine you've seen where you use questioning starts by taking uh, an offence for which there is no mandatory right to legal representation. You get the information you really want and then you charge them with what you really were intending to do all along, which is the much more serious offence. And the court has also emphasised that the waiver uh, cannot be regarded as, as covering the whole proceeding. So if someone says, yes, I was willing to talk now, but I'm not any longer without the assistance of a lawyer, then that must be acted on. And merely by a person remaining silent, uh, or being told that they can remain silent, um, does not mean that they have implicitly waived their right. It's also important to recognise that the court has seen that the right of access to a lawyer applies not only when a person is being questioned formally, but it applies to any informal question, and certainly it applies whenever a person is, it becomes clear to those interrogating them that they are a suspect rather than a witness, uh, because it clearly the situation will be that you know uh, from what a person has said that this person is no longer just providing evidence as a witness, really you think that this person is guilty. It also applies to interrogation which takes place under international letters of request, so outside the regular kind of proceedings, and in, important for some countries where a person voluntarily surrenders to custody, because in some cases, if you voluntarily surrender them, the guarantees which might exist under national law uh, about access to lawyer do not normally apply. Um, it also is seen as applying to confrontations uh, at an early stage proceedings. So, that if, for example, um, you have the suspect being confronted with the victim, then that's a situation in which there should be access to a lawyer. It also applies to the reconstruction of events, and probably, although the court has not uh, yet decided this conclusively, to the conduct of identification rights. So again, you get some important errors. Perhaps 
most interesting in the case of the court, um, they will consider that the use against an accused person of evidence obtained from witnesses at the trial who did not have access to legal advice in respect of an accused may also render the proceedings of that trial unfair. So in other words, where you have witnesses who have been the object of criminal proceedings themselves and then have not had access to legal advice, but then they become witnesses in the proceedings against another person, then the lack of fairness of those witnesses' conduct will be imported into the proceedings against the person of subsequent trial. Finally, in terms of importance, I think it's also significant that the court in the Dvorsky case made it clear that the question of the lawyer to whom you have access, the choice, should be an informed one. Uh, and so in that case, you had a situation where the person had a lawyer which he wanted to have, uh, but was palmed off with a publicly funded lawyer without being aware that the lawyer he wanted to have was at the police station ready to provide evidence, but they just didn't tell him that that person was there. So the need for being aware of the choice you make is important. The court hasn't got into the question, as far as I'm aware, of the issue of legal aid in terms of access to a lawyer. But it seems to me that really that shouldn't be an important barrier because the question of access to a lawyer at that stage is critical, as I try to suggest, and therefore the need for it, regardless of whether you're rich or not, is neither here nor there, so therefore you come back to the circumstances of the case. And there is no real risk because the court also has a well-developed case law that there can be a requirement to reimburse the costs of a lawyer uh, and therefore there is no risk to the public purse by having an automatic requirement. And it should be said that um, if you look at Ukraine, which is a country which is beset with lots of problems, there they have already up and running a system where automatically legal aid lawyers provide advice. And if Ukraine can do it in the middle of conflict with Russia, then I don't think there's really a reason why it can't be done in most other European countries. Um, now, all these developments I've talked about are really good developments, but of course they will be meaningless in reality unless you change the approach that you have in the court of taking more seriously the situation of a denial of access. And the reason for taking it seriously is that if you don't find that the right of access to the lawyer is a discrete right, then you can have no steps taken to secure the dealing with this failure when it comes to the execution of judgments. Uh, and as I've said, already in many instances we seem to see a systemic failure and in reality, what will be appropriate is perhaps for the court to consider adopting a pilot judgment in respect of some of these cases, so that actually uh, a course of action for dealing with this problem. But of course, that cannot happen unless the court regards the question of denial of access as itself um, a discrete right. So the court, to my mind, needs to break the link which it has made, the unnecessary link it's made between Article 6.1 and Article 6.3c. This may seem shocking uh, to the established view, but it, it really is not something which is essential. You don't see, for example, a link being made between Article 6.2, presumption innocence, and Article 6.1. Uh, Article 6, paragraph 2 is an independent right. And interestingly, even in relation to Article 6 through C, uh, when the court has been faced with cases where there has been breach of confidentiality in discussions with the lawyer, the court has found a violation of Article 6.1 taken with Article 6.3c, but says nothing at all about the question of whether the fairness of the proceedings has been compromised. So there is no real reason why it needs to do this in relation to the, the very actual issue of access. And working with hindsight is not really the best way of determining whether rights under the Convention are protected.
There will, of course, be some cases where compromise, fairness is definitely compromised. Um, indeed, the judgment yesterday in Dimitar Mitev against Bulgaria is a very good example of this. Where the evidence was very strong that the denial of access to the lawyer had an effect. But in many cases, it's not as clear cut. You can't be sure. And I'm not sure that the court itself in Strasbourg is well placed to do it. Therefore, it would be much better if the court took the stance that there needs to be uh, a discreet right of access to a lawyer and that the implementation of this discreet right can then be supervised by the committee of ministers in the execution of the judgments. There will undoubtedly be some who say, well, if you do this, this will lead to an increase in the caseload of the court. All the time, there is concern about too many cases. But if this issue is addressed head on, then the likelihood is that over the long term, there will be a reduction in the complaints that criminal proceedings be unfair because the person has been represented. It may be that we shouldn't hold our breath that the Grand Chamber in the upcoming judgment in Berzy against Belgium will actually act upon this kind of analysis. But if it doesn't, then the alternative will be to keep on relying, at least if you're in the European Union, on directives, uh, or to, if you're outside the European Union, to hone your arguments based upon the factors uh, which the court listed in the Raymond Simeone cases. Certainly, there is no scope to argue, as was once attempted in a Belgian case, that the legal basis for a person's deprivation of liberty will be affected by the fact that he or she has been deprived of access uh, to the assistance of a lawyer while in custody. So the picture is not entirely encouraging, but the battle should continue. Thank you very much.